it's really about how stuff is made and how it can be made better and looking at a whole host of different materials. This book, I have a co-author, Paul Folks Ariano, and I've told this story in other places. Paul and I have told it together that he bought my first book, Material Value, in 2020, and then he reached out to me and we kept in touch. We met for the first time in person in April 2024 when this book launched. Hi everyone, welcome to Now Boarding, a travel podcast by me, Pyle Nair. This show aims at creating awareness about ecotourism, sustainable tourism, responsible travel, and a lot more. We will cover stories and journeys of people who are ecotourism specialists and those who are leaders in their field. We will also be talking to people who have had unique travel experiences, remarkable conceptual places to stay, unexplored cultures and ancient histories of various towns and cities around the world. Join me in this journey of knowing more about travel. Get inspired to see the world and discover your inner self. Hi everyone, today I am in conversation again for the second time. Uh, my guest is Julia Freer Goldstein. Julia is a very accomplished human being. She is an author, she's a business owner dedicated to making manufacturing more environment. She's got a unique blend, which is so interesting, of expertise in engineering, in journalism, content creating, and teaching. And she helps manufacturers align their business goals with environmental action and effective communication strategies. And Julia just mentioned to me before we started the conversation that her recent book was published and was launched in April of this year. So we're going to talk a lot more about that as well. But thank you, Julia, for coming back on the show for a second time. I'm so happy to talk to you. Yeah, I'm glad to be here. I look forward to the conversation. Okay, so Julia, let's start with trying to get an understanding from you on what are carbon calculators on airline booking platforms and how accurate are they? Ah, it's a relatively new phenomenon that when people book airline travel on some platforms, they have a car a calculator that'll say this is so many kilograms of new emissions for your travel. And those, they are based on, and I am, okay, I will preface this by saying I am not an expert in carbon calculators. Okay. I don't actually do those kind of calculations for people, but they are based on certain industry averages. And it takes a look at what type of plane it is, how full it's going to tend to be and where it's going. And then it comes up with a calculator and it might say, for this particular trip, the average is 280 kilograms. And then you can look, oh, is your flight more or less? Or, well, some of them are just the same, obviously, but yeah. some might be 10 or 20% more, some might be 10% less. So it's essentially a new technology, which, excuse me, which a lot of the airlines are now introducing, right? I think the, what they're introducing is putting a calculator that customers actually see. Yeah, essentially, my understanding would be that then you as a customer being responsible for your own um, decision as far as travel goes. They're putting it on the customer as well to get more responsible. Yes, it's a way of just providing more information. People have been used to for a long time looking at how much is it going to cost me? How long is it going to take me to get there? How many stops do I have to make? What is my layover if I have to make multiple stops? And they might look at, say, an airline's safety record. Yeah. They look at those kind of things. And now this is an additional piece of data. And one interesting thing that I found when looking at these for a flight that I was taking not that long ago, a few weeks back, I needed to do some business travel, was that I just had assumed a nonstop flight is going to involve fewer emissions because there's that, all the thing about takeoff and landing, that uses more fuel. There's a different piece 
of the equation is what kind of plane are they using? And it could be that a flight with a stop that is using newer planes that are more fuel efficient actually has lower emissions than a nonstop that's flying on an older aircraft. So yeah, I was going to ask you that, in fact, in terms of making a choice when it comes to carbon emission, then it is it better for customers to take to try and take a nonstop versus a multi-stop of uh, uh, flight. Yeah, so you've answered that for me. So for someone who is trying to look for ways in which they can reduce their carbon footprint while they meet their travel needs, what is some kind of advice that you could offer? Sorry, my throat, you'll have to excuse me for this one. But so what is the kind of advice that you may offer customers who are wanting to be the they're trying to find ways of being responsible travel. Yes, it's interesting because there is a whole spectrum. I know people who have decided not to fly at all because of their concern about emissions. I also know people who fly everywhere all the time, seeming without even being concerned about the emissions at all. And there's many people who are in between. It's an interesting thing. And there's, I guess there's business travel and there's personal travel. And yeah. one thing with personal travel is in, I don't know, many generations ago when families and extended families for up and down the generations would all live in the same village or even maybe the next village over town or city or what have you. And now people are so spread out. Yeah. And they might think, if I never fly on an airplane, I will never be able to see my parents or I will never be able to see my children or my nieces or nephews. And so I can understand that. I live in Seattle and my older son just moved to New York. I don't want to never see him, but yeah. Now we can also get into other forms of travel. Taking a train all the way across the country, we can get into that in a little bit uh, later, maybe why that might be not be the better solution. Yeah. yeah. Uh, anyway, and then for business, there is a benefit to being in person. My latest business travel, I attended a conference about 3D printing. I had a chance to meet with people, to go out on an exhibit floor and see their different products in action, talk to them about it and make those personal connections. And then I traveled to visit a client where I was for two days on site with them, interviewing their employees, seeing their facilities, seeing how they're manufacturing things. And there's, yes, you can interview people on Zoom. And I have excellent friends and business colleagues that I've worked with that I've only really ever seen on a video conference. But there's also something to be said for meeting in person. Yeah. I think there's there needs to be a balance. And it's I think it's just not realistic to expect, oh, we're just not going to travel by air. That's not going to happen. But I also think that there are some people that ought to curtail their travel. Yeah. Maybe Not fly so often. The, yeah. Or if they're doing a business trip, then combine it so that they're not going back and forth, but they're just extending from one destination to the next and then coming back to, to base just so that it definitely would reduce their carbon footprint, right? Because they're not... Yeah, because yeah. you're just making the most of a trip. And I think yeah. just thinking about how can you justify it if for business reasons or to visit family, you need to travel thousands of miles. How can you, as you said, combine the trips, yeah. make it more efficient? Not everyone can do that all the time, but I think it's just something to be worth thinking about. There's also putting pressure on the airline industry yeah. as well <clears throat> yeah. to increase the use of sustainable, more sustainable fuels, more efficient aircraft. There, there's so many new technology and new materials that can help with light weighting. There's, there are a lot of exciting possibilities, but that of course all takes a big investment of time and money. It cannot happen instantly. Yeah, but do you think airlines are actually now working towards creating different types of aircraft in order to have more 
sustainable aviation fuel. And I know that is obviously not very co cost effective for the airlines. And what happens is that the customers then end up having to pay an increase fare because they are. Yeah. yeah. So I know there's also some airlines, you buy a ticket and they say, oh, do you want to pay an extra 5% or an extra I don't know if it's 5%, maybe it's not that much, yeah, but certain not, dollar yeah. amounts and you do this offset. And part of the problem with offsets, not just for airline travel, but for everything, is it feels a little bit like a get out of jail free card. It says, I can pollute, I can create as much carbon emissions as I want, and all I need to do is pay my tax and they will magically go away. Yeah, They don't magically yeah. go away. Ideally, they are invested in projects that are actually helping, because that's a whole nother story. But even so, reducing first needs to be the approach. And I think a lot of times businesses do put too much of the pressure on the individual because they can just say, yeah, customer, it's on you. Yeah. Yeah. So tell me a little bit about your book because you mentioned that you recently published a new book. So what is the book about? Yes. Well, if I tell you the title, that'll tell you a little bit about what it's about. <laughs> Materials and Sustainability, Building a Circular Future. And it's really about how stuff is made and how it can be made better and looking at a whole host of different materials. This book, I have a co-author, Paul Folks Ariano, and I've told this story in other places, Paul and I have told it together that he bought my first book, Material Value, in 2020, and then he reached out to me and we kept in touch. We met for the first time in person in April 2024 when this book launched. So there are there's chapters about metals, plastic, glass, pulp and paper products, and novel materials that are mostly bioplastics. And it also talks about the way things are made and thinking about recycling and using recycled content as that's not the first answer. We need to really change what materials we're using, first of all, and then think about how much we can reuse things. And then we're looking into different ways of making things, including additive manufacturing. Most people have heard of 3D printing, that's yeah. additive. You put layers on top of layers instead of taking a big block and machining away the parts you don't want. Yeah. <laughs> so it's essentially the materials and it could work for any industry, right? It's not any manufacturing industry. It's not any one specific industry. It's essentially... Yeah, we're taking a materials focus and saying, really, we as a whole society, the world need to change how we're using materials, especially the problem of just considering them to be disposable. And because all of those different classes of materials are used in packaging. And that's, we could get into, that's a whole long discussion. But basically the idea that it's not just about carbon emissions. Yeah. It's about the materials we use. And there are a lot of carbon emissions embodied in how we are making those materials. And I could talk on for hours about that, but I I don't think we have time. Yeah. Yeah. No, we can, you can come back to my show for a third time. So that's interesting. So between our previous conversation and now, have you seen any kind of innovation, any kind of changes that you feel had a better impact or there is still a lot more that sort of it's not long enough for any kind of changes to be visible. Yes and yes. There, okay. there are new materials coming out. There are so many new companies in this you know, the five years between these two books. And again, the second book is based on material value. So that's how this whole thing evolved, saying it's still a good book. A lot has changed. There are companies that I mentioned in material value that no longer exist. There are companies that I talk about and organizations that I talk about in materials and sustainability that weren't around when I was publishing material value. Things are changing rapidly. There's also a lot of confusion about 
what is actually going to be so-called more sustainable. I think just like you talk about sustainable travel, can we sustain everybody traveling all over the globe all the time? To some degree, it, I don't know if that's the really the right question to ask. Yeah. Part of the challenge is looking at things holistically. What I have seen in the last few years is definitely increased awareness, increased discussion of, yes, we need to do this. But then sometimes there's also the backlash and the people who will say, oh, yes, it's everybody's saying it's all about the environment and sustainability, but they're not thinking about money and how are we going to afford this, et cetera, et cetera. There still can sometimes be these conflicting forces. And what I like to do is emphasize the positive, emphasize ways in which things are happening. And some things, and this is also an issue that I address in my books, regulations. And sometimes what you need often is a regulation to drive behavior because the companies, unless they're going to be rewarded or taxed for making different choices, are going to keep doing things the same way they've always been doing. And that's sometimes human nature. We yeah. all want to just do things the way we've always done them until we find a good reason to change because change is hard. Yeah. Change is hard. Yeah, absolutely. You have to change mindset. You have to change behavior. There's so many different aspects which need to be incorporated and only then can it be a holistic change. So yeah, no, you're absolutely right. So what's next for you in terms, are you working on another book? Not, no, <laughs> not quite yet. Really working on spreading the messages of these. But one other thing about travel and about the idea of change and trying to do things in a better way, a more environmentally responsible way, train travel can be a good option. And I, in fact, just a few hours ago, got back from a trip to Eugene, Oregon. I live near Seattle, Washington, and it's about six, seven hours by train. It's about an hour and a half by plane, although you have to get to the airport much earlier, door to door, it's probably four hours versus. Yeah. And on the way back, I chose to go by train and we have here Amtrak trains. Yeah. I still support train travel, but unfortunately in the US, Amtrak does not have the funding it needs. The trains are old. They, we're looking out, the windows are dirty. You don't yeah. want to be looking out of dirty windows because part of the joy of train travel is you can see the world going by. You can see these different towns and rural areas, mountains, whatever, rivers, what you're passing through. And if you're looking through it in dirt, through dirty windows, it just makes the experience not as good. And there's some places where the train just seemed awfully bumpy. And I think, again, I'm inside the train, so I don't absolutely know what's going on. But I think part of the problem might be they're not maintaining the tracks as well. And trains in Europe are much smoother, much faster, because people take them. And it just, it's, it's a chicken and egg thing too. If not that many people are taking the trains, they're not having the money to do the upkeep. So then the upkeep isn't as good. So then not as many people want to take the train. And the United States is also spread out. It's yeah. so much larger. Yeah. We don't have as many different metropolitan areas close to each other as some other parts of the world. Yeah. So there, there's a lot of different aspects, but I wish we had better train travel options in the United States. Yeah, but also like you're mentioning distances. Imagine taking a train from, I, I was talking to someone recently and they said they just in the US wanted to experience train travel. And they, I think took a train from, I, if I remember correctly, from California to Florida. Oh my. And they would, and it, I don't know how many days <laughs> it, it took them, but they said they wanted to do it and how many times they needed to change and all of that, but they did it. it I'm not sure what the reason was or whether they were trying to be responsible and not take a flight or 
whether they just wanted to enjoy the experience. I'm not sure what the reason was, but they did it. And so it is possible, but then for a business traveler, okay, you did not, for you, the train trip was seven hours. But if imagine if you had time constraints and you had to get to a meeting quickly, or if it was an emergency or whatever, then there's no way in which, then you would have to fly. There's no other options. It depends on what the schedules are like and when the next yeah, flight yeah. is coming. That, there's that too. And I think it, it really does depend on the distance. And so when you've got, and I think there's even rules that have come into place in some countries in Europe that if the distance is shorter than a certain amount, and I don't know the amount, that you may not take a plane, but it's a fairly short distance. It's, I think it's something where it would only take an hour or two by train or car. Yeah. And that's where it is, it doesn't really make sense to fly. I would definitely not fly from Seattle to Portland. Yeah. That is three, three and a half hours by either train or car. Yeah. And you spend more time getting to the airport and getting up. And then by the time your flight just barely gets to cruising altitude, you go right back down again. Correct. So I would say that if it's really close together like that, then that's really not worth it. But if you're flying all the way across the country, then it's, it's just not realistic. There's a train that goes from Seattle to Chicago. I think it takes two or three days and a flight takes about three hours. Yeah. Yeah, two or three days if you have the time, fine. But as you mentioned, if you have to look out of dirty windows and <laughs> and there is no upkeep of the train, you're not comfortable. Once you get to your destination, you'll be like grumpy and frustrated and annoyed. So that also adds to the decision that someone would, would take. Okay, just moving in a different direction, I just wanted to ask you, how do you think future, the future technological advancements like electric planes change the landscape of air travel emissions? I think planes is a complicated concept and it there's a problem about just the batteries that would be required and that I remember attending a talk about it and for very small planes and, and a short distance, it can be done. There would be just so much light weighting that would need to happen. The planes would have to be so much lighter to manage the batteries or if you could really make extensive use of solar because you're above the clouds when you're flying. Yeah, You have the sun on you, except for at night, of course, in nighttime flights, then that's a whole nother story. But for flights during the day, and see, that's another issue, right? Okay, yeah, we can fly you there because we have the solar power during the day. But once the sun goes down, forget it. And in wintertime, when there's only six hours of daylight, oh, it's it, the, the scheduling is looking really tricky. So that's, again, I am not an expert in that area. I know that there's a lot of things that are technologically possible, it doesn't mean they're feasible to actually put into place. And I see that all the time with new materials because I can get all excited about them too. Wow, this new biomaterial or a new composite and look what it can do. And isn't that amazing? Realizing we can make a small amount of it in the lab under carefully controlled conditions. If we try to make kilogram upon kilogram of it or a million pieces of whatever you're going to build, right? You want it to go into a product where you're making millions or tens of millions of that product and you want the material in it, the supplies aren't there. And the process that worked in the lab doesn't just translate to a high volume factory. Yeah. It is a long involved process to make that happen. And so it's easy to sometimes get excited about new technology because it is so cool. And those of us who have an interest in science and engineering and technology can get excited about it. And then we have to temper that a little bit mm -hmm. to say, let's look at the reality of, is there a market for it? Can it be scaled in a way that makes sense? 
And if it can't, what's standing in the way? And what can we do about those obstacles? And it's just complicated. In any example, it would take a great many people working together. I think that is really what we need. We need a lot of collaboration yeah. to solve some of these big problems. But you're absolutely right. Testing something in a lab versus manufacturing it in volume is a completely different ball game. So yeah, so there's so much to explore and there's so much to actually try and work around that it must keep people who are in the manufacturing industry very busy. <laughs> and especially now with so much focus on sustainability in terms of carbon emission, uh, how to try and find different ways of reducing the carbon footprint. I think it's very challenging, but it's also exciting to, and, and the fact that there's a goal which would lead uh, people up to trying to make make things work. So, yeah, no, it's interesting. And I think what you're doing is also trying to get manufacturing companies to become more aware and more responsible and have a better understanding of what it means to be sustainable. I think that's that's the kind of work which is so important and the fact that you have a combination of being able to because you understand manufacturing with your engineering background to become a consultant is i think is phenomenal so it's been so lovely talking to you julia and i am i will not be surprised if you reach out to me again like six months <laughs> later and say look I have something new to talk about and I would absolutely love to have you back on my show. Thanks so much. Hope you enjoyed this episode of Now Boarding, a travel podcast. Check out other episodes on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts or wherever else you listen to podcasts. And of course, don't forget to share your thoughts with us. Stay tuned for more exciting episodes only on Now Boarding, a travel podcast. <laughs>